this thing. Uh, Jesus is all the world to me. It's uh, 185. <laughs>
Um, good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. Good to have uh, you all here with us at Fountain at Maroubra, again to worship the, the Lord. And I want to just uh, start off straight away in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to, well, I'm not actually going to refer to the text at the moment, but um, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about how this world looked like or what this world looked like when God created it. At the very end of chapter 1, it was declared that this world was what? Perfect. Beautiful. Very good. A couple of good wild guesses there, but uh, the text actually says very good, doesn't it? Which would imply beautiful and it would also imply perfect. And so um, it, it was indeed. It wasn't just declared to be so, it very much was so. And uh, I guess we can really only rely upon our imaginations to picture or imagine what that uh, must have been like back there. You know, in many respects, we can uh, see in our world many, many, many beautiful things, amazing things, uh, but they are just a dim reflection of what it must have been when God originally had created our world so long ago. Um, there's another mention, it doesn't actually mention it in chapter 1, but in uh, the middle of chapter 2, it, it goes on to talk about another aspect of this creation about being very good, and that's uh, where it talks about God uh, establishing a garden. We know it, of course, as the Garden of Eden, and this is where God placed Adam and Eve. This was their home in this particular garden, and I guess in my own imagination, I, I see this as some, in somehow or other even more perfect than the rest of the world was, uh, if that's possible. Um, this was their Eden home. We called paradise. We, we, we just use these... Uh, um, exorbitant terms maybe, to try and uh, picture and imagine what it must have been like in their, in their Eden home. I understand the, uh, the Hebrew word for garden is actually like an enclosure, not necessarily referring to the beautiful flowers and trees and shrubs and so forth, despite the fact that that was all very true, but it was actually an enclosure and that has implications I guess as well and we'll see that as we, uh, as we go through the message for today. Um, but I think, you know, as I think about Eden, I see it as this, this ultimate perfection in this world. You know, God himself is the, is the ultimate being of perfection, but he made this garden in such a special way that uh, you could see it as even being beyond the perfection of this very good, as God declared the world in its beginning. Now, if you'd like to come to the book of Job with me, Job chapter 38 and verses 4 through 7, Job 38 verses 4 through 7, I want to just try and elaborate briefly here on just how good this place was. Job 38, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 7. I'm in the wrong place. Job 38. Okay, here we go. Job 38, starting at verse 4. And here is God uh, speaking out of the whirlwind to Job. And he says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know, these uh, angelic beings have witnessed the creation of this world, the establishment of uh, Adam and Eve in their Eden home, and it says that they sang with joy and delight as they, been, as they beheld this beautiful and perfect place that God had made. And, uh, you know, I guess for us, you know, we, we do, we sang this morning about the garden and how we rejoice in being in the presence of God. And in our daily lives, we can rejoice and sing praise to God because he brings that joy to our hearts, doesn't he? But here is some, this is something really, really special. You know, the angels beheld and witnessed God as he made this beautiful, perfect world and they sang with delight and shouted for joy when they beheld what God had made. So let's come back to Genesis again in chapter 2 and touch on where what God instructed Adam and Eve when he placed them in this garden home. This is in Genesis chapter 2 and first of all in verse 8, which references... Uh, the Garden of Eden for the first time. It says, The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. 
and then down at verse 15, and then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So God put him there for a reason. He had a purpose in mind when he made this garden and when he placed Adam and his wife Eve in this garden. It was there to be tended and kept. They had a responsibility, a care, a burden, a chore, um, a, a delight, a, a privilege, if you like, all of those things. And their, and their care was to look after the garden, to tend it, to, to look after it. And, uh, you know, anyone who's grown their own gardens, uh, if they know, that they know that if they have, want to have a successful garden, a beautiful garden, a productive garden, it takes care, doesn't it? You can't just leave a garden to itself because you'll have, particularly in this world, perhaps not so much in Eden, but in this world, of course, you'll have pests will come, insects. You'll have weeds that will spring up. Um, my wife at the moment is growing some vines that are growing and she's been on to me now for weeks to bring my drill home where it, be where it belongs, it's elsewhere, and to fix some um, screens up so that the, the vines can actually grow through these screens where we want them to go. And I'd noticed out the window the other day that the, one of these vines is about, it must be at least, I don't know, a metre and a half or maybe two metres from its base and it's, it's freestanding, it's not hanging onto anything, but it's, it's, it's actually growing and protruding out almost, uh, is it perpendicular, horizontal? Just, it's just growing and it's, it's just got enough strength in itself to hold itself up. And it's about this long, just, just horizontal like that. And amazing the strength in that slender, yeah. only about a millimetre or two thick, it has enough strength to support its own weight. But of course it's waiting for something to cling onto and, and twirl around. And I believe uh, it's very clear from what... Adam and Eve's uh, work was back in the garden. It wasn't so much to pull the weeds or to chase off the insects or to fertilise the ground. All of that God had cared for. In fact, there was no insects, there were no weeds. It was a perfect garden. But they were there to tend the vines, to, to, to uh, help them to grow and to put them where they wanted to be. In fact, it says in, I think it's uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, that they were to form bowers. You know what a bower is? It's like a, it's like a shelter. It makes it like a fort, an arch, like a shape. A bow bird makes its own arch yeah. and its place where it uh, courtship for the partner and that. And they bring their little um, trinkets there and place them there on the floor under the bower. But yeah, so they were to train the vines and the, and the branches of the trees as a, to make a home. They didn't have a house or a hut or a castle or a mansion. They lived there in the garden under the beautiful foliage and the plants that God had made for them. And their job was to care for it, to keep it, to tend for it. Um, let me see. In verse 28 now, back in chapter 1, sorry, verse 28, it says this, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So firstly, it was God's intention and purpose that Adam and Eve procreate. Multiply, fill the earth. That was, their, that was their first command, wasn't it, when he made them? Of course, uh, God made man in uh, many respects in his own image and one of, those, one of those images was to be able to procreate. Uh, there was other, other aspects to that we'll come back to briefly, but number one, they were created in physical form. I believe it's, uh, there's enough biblical evidence to suggest that God also has physical form, perhaps beyond our comprehension, but nonetheless there is evidence for that. But uh, they had the capacity to procreate, to regenerate and produce after their own kind. Remember all the other animals were told to produce after their own kind? Adam and Eve were told that they also were to, to populate the earth, to fill it up. And also then to subdue it and have dominion over it. Now, unfortunately, some have taken this to mean that, that uh, we were, like, if you like, the, the kings of the world. We own the world and we can do what we like with it. We can exploit it, just like humankind has learned to do. Um, I saw a picture the other day on the internet, a really, really beautiful forest with a lake and a valley and hillsides, just idyllic. And then the next picture you see, the mining company had gone in there and just completely destroyed the place. And you think, what a, what a disgrace we are that we do such terrible things to our own, our own home, our own world. Um, you know, we destroy our own habitat. And, uh, but God's intention was that we care for it, have dominion over it. Yes, we, we're managers, we're stewards. We're to look after it, to make it flourish. God's original purpose wasn't changed. 
when, um, when sin entered the equation, they still had the responsibility of, of procreating and, and caring for the world. Um, but unfortunately, of course, sin uh, changed things, and we'll come back to that point also. So they were to multiply, they were expand the garden, and, and perhaps even we could imagine the garden finally encompassing the whole world. It's entirely uh, cover the whole with this Edenic, Edenic perfection. Maybe that was a part of what God intended the world to, to end, end up looking like in partnership with Adam and Eve and their offspring, in generation after generation, growing further and further beyond the, the confines of that enclosure that God originally made and uh, making it the beautiful place that uh, it could be, that God intended it to be. Another thing about um, God's intention originally was that he made Adam and Eve with, I guess we'd have to say, conditional immortality. But immortality, they were born to live forever, weren't they? Or created to live forever. And of course, we understand that in the context of having access to the tree of life. While ever they could come to the tree and eat the fruit from the tree of life, they would continue to live forever. But uh, tragically, we see in this story there that once they did uh, take the forbidden fruit, then God banished them from the garden and they had no longer any access to the tree of life, thus bringing to end there what would have been immortality. And so, but God's plan was that they have that immortality, the potential to live forever and enlarge the kingdom that God had given them in this world. So I guess it's, uh, it's important for us to, to um, say, though, that we can really only speculate about how beautiful that place was, how magnificent and perfect it was. We have those few words. There's a few references only in the spirit of prophecy that I'm aware of that describe the garden and how perfect and beautiful it was. And, um, but we have to come to the point of acknowledging that in our, in our finite minds, we're limited in our capacity to, to explain or describe or even imagine just how beautiful and perfect it was. Just like we can't really describe what heaven will be like. We can, we can dream, we can speculate, we can talk, but at the end of the day, we are limited in understanding how just beautiful and perfect it, it, it will be. So let's come to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. And touch on this point where Paul uh, makes it very clear that in our finite human thinking, we have a limited capacity only to, to imagine just how wonderful our original world was. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says this, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So not only can we, we've never seen it, we've never heard it, we can't even imagine how beautiful God's eternal kingdom will be. And I guess it's fair to assume, likewise, we can't really imagine how beautiful and perfect God's original garden was. And in, from the great controversy, it says this, no finite mind can comprehend the glory of of the paradise of God. And so we're left here to, to wonder, to imagine, to dream and uh, to hope. And unfortunately, there are many in the world who, who have no hope. They can't see beyond the reality of this world. They're, they're confined in their thinking because of prejudice or because of presuppositions or because of traditions. They're confined to the limitations of what they can see and feel and hear and know in that way. Um, yeah, by the senses that God has given to us. They can't see beyond the realm of this, of this what we have uh, available to our senses and to imagine beyond. So we, we're sort of stuck in the middle there. We can, we can look and dream and imagine beyond what we see and feel and hear, but we can't yet enter into the secrets of God which lay beyond our, our, our mortal uh, state. So I want to just um, get you thinking a little bit about what are the most amazingly beautiful and awesome and awe-inspiring things that you have seen and witnessed or experienced or might dream of witnessing or seeing or, it's, or experiencing. And I heard someone say this last night at our care group, the most beautiful experience that she's ever, ever had in her whole life, and this is a mature woman, for her it was giving birth to her three children. And she, uh, she didn't elaborate, but... I could just see on her face this expression of just delight 
as she reflected and, and went back to that moment in time when she bore, gave birth to her three children. Yeah, it's a miracle, isn't it? And I've seen some... Um, um, I saw one recently, some photographs taken um, inside a woman at the moment of conception uh, between the, the male sperm and the, and the female ova. And then, you, you, just amazing, seeing the little journey. But these, are, these are actual microscopic photographic images. That there's one in a video. Um, but just absolutely sensational to see that miracle uh, of, of new life commencing. Um, what about for you? I mean, what sort of things would really stand out as something just completely awesome or beautiful or something that maybe brought tears to your eyes or caused you to go, wow. You can speak. Just nature. Just nature. Yeah, so the book of nature overall. I mean, climbing and going walking the mountain trails, uh, walking along the seaside. Waterfalls, yeah. Uh, sailing on a boat. Um, I think Jamie and Christiana... Uh, sunsets and sunrises, that's right. Yeah. Jamie and Christiana recently went out on one of those tall ships and just had a brief little sail around out there in the harbour. But uh, have you ever been out in the open ocean on a sailing boat? Yes. Yeah, with, a, yeah, with the big uh, sails and everything, you know? Um, something that would be, I think, scary. I've been up in Broken Bay where it was, I mean, quite a large swell, probably two or three metre swell in a sailing boat. It felt like the ocean, but it wasn't, wasn't like, you know, the ocean. <laughs> um, I mean, that's something that would, some people would just really resonate with. What about something like skydiving or you know, looking, at, looking from a high, like flying an aeroplane even, and looking down on the vastness of the world beneath? Uh, yeah, some people may not like flying. It's a bit terrifying, perhaps. The yeah, there's some they... absolutely amazing shots. And people, of course, are prepared to pay millions and millions of dollars to experience that, mm -hmm. uh, just so they can have that experience of just weightlessness and looking at the world from beyond. I don't think they get to see the whole world. You need to go to the moon almost, I think, to be able to see the entire That's globe. Incredible. It would be. What about um, some more simple things? Working in the garden. You know, anybody have a real, real joy in that? Yeah, I, I love it. That's what I think. Yeah. Looking at um, opening. Sorry, Isabella? Oh, OK. What about having a, having a conversation with a close friend or family member? You know, having a good, nice heart-to-heart. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Yeah. Having friendships, yeah. Yeah. P having, having relationships with people. You know, to me, um, you know, we may take it for granted, but nonetheless, I believe it is one of the most precious gifts that God has given to us, you know, relationships. And, of course, beyond that, a relationship with God himself. You know, have you ever wept as you've talked with God or as you've heard God yeah. speaking to you? Has it ever brought tears of joy and delight to your experience? I think most of us could, could reflect and could recall those times when you've just had that, that uh, sense of closeness to God. I know um, Cheryl and Beverly enjoy going out whale watching, mm -hmm. uh, another awe-inspiring thing to do. Uh, what about owning a dog, <laughs> you know, uh, having a pet? <laughs> no, some people are going, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, cats are okay, I suppose. <laughs> Um, what about having a spouse? You know, many of us have had the, the joyful experience of having a, a life partner. And, um, you know, there's listening to beautiful music, um, beautiful singing. You know, the human voice is such a beautiful instrument, isn't it? And, um, you know, we have so much in life that we can, in this fallen world we're talking about, that, we, that brings sort of a sense of awe and it, it makes our skin tingle and uh, the hair stands up on the back of our neck. And it just brings us a great sense of completeness, a sense of knowing who we are, who we belong to, and, heaven, and what it's all about. Well, that was my next line. Um, <laughs> I said, imagine, imagine all of that, and my next line says, now multiply any or all of that by infinity, because that's what it would be like, beyond what we can imagine. And we, can, we could spend hours, you know, contemplating in quietness on our own some of those beautiful things and experiences that God has given us in life. But they just pale into complete insignificance. Even animals would be even better. Even better, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, um, I'm just wondering if my dog's going to be with me in the kingdom. But um, God knows what's best, and we'll, we'll wait and see. Now, let's come back to our Bibles and look at the book of Revelation. We could uh, get lost in thought there if we're not too careful. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21. And I believe we find here hints that the Garden of Eden will be restored. Now, it's only, it's only hints or 
you have to read between the lines a little bit, perhaps. Um, let's have a look at 21.1. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So here we see the, the world made new. Sin has finally been eradicated from the universe. Satan and all sinners have been destroyed. All of our tears have been wiped away by God. We're at perfect peace and harmony. Now, a friend of mine preached a sermon many years ago. I'll never forget the title and the general gist of his sermon was the least happy day in heaven. And his uh, contention was the least happy day in heaven was the very first day. And we know how joyous that will be. But it's only going to get better and better and better, you see, as we experience all the delights and the joys of the kingdom that lasts for eternity. You know, moving beyond time to a, to a kingdom and a, a dimension we can only dream and imagine about now. But, you know, the very um, the books we call the Conflict of the Ages series, many of you would know about them. The very first words in book one are what, do you know? God is love. God is love. And the very last words in book five are God is love. And as a, the last paragraph of that book, if you read that when you go home at some time or look it on your smartphone, it just brings my, makes my hair stand on end. The beautiful description of what that will be like. In, in, a, in a way that we can at least begin to understand. So look at verses 5 and 6. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the water of the fountain of life freely to him who thirsts. And so all things will be made new. Um, we're told here that the water of life would be available to those who thirst for it. And uh, it's my understanding that the water of life came from the Garden of Eden originally, didn't it? That's where it was, the tree of life, the, the water of life. And I believe that this it sort of implies to us that the Garden of Eden will be re-established. Of course, uh, we could look to the spirit of prophecy and see confirmation for that. Chapter, two, chapter 22 and verses 1 and 2. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so again, we see this impl implication that in the earth made new, God's garden will be re-established there. We'll have access to the tree of life to eat the fruit thereof. We'll have access to the river of life, the, that beautiful crystal clear water, that will give us eternal life, eternal vigour. And so just from these uh, brief references, we see there that God has a plan worked out that will be restored back to all that was lost will be given back and, uh, and beyond. I believe that indeed that this world will ultimately be fully um, covered by that garden that God originally intended. I want to come back to the Old Testament briefly and notice in the book of Isaiah some further references to this. Uh, Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 18. Isaiah 32, if you're following along, and verse 18. Of course, um, we know Isaiah is the, what we call the gospel prophet with some uh, fantastic references to the coming of Jesus and what he would experience in order to save us. But here's a reference to um, uh, our final um, destiny, if you like. God says, My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. You know, we live in a troubled world, don't we? And uh, I guess we're, to a very large degree, desensitised to the extent of our brokenness, our own personal brokenness and the brokenness of the world in which we live. And so that's why it's so hard for us to imagine this place, a peaceful habitation, quiet resting places. You know, it's very rare for us to have that, that sense of peace and quietness in this life. We're, we're so hustle and bustle. And there's always, you know, the, the astronomers can't do their work in the cities. They need to go way out in the country, away from the light. The light is so intrusive into their work and likewise with sound you know, to try and shut out sound completely is quite difficult and I, I suspect that most of us would be quite uncomfortable with that perfect silence 
we you know we're so accustomed to it it's such a part of our everyday lives even in the in our sleep there's there's noise particularly living in the cities you know in the country i remember one particular night i was out camping and i'd hurt my knee and so my colleagues had, had walked on for the there was a hike not it wasn't a camp it was a hike and i stayed by myself overnight in this camping place and all i could hear was the crackle of the fire and the and the, the water in the stream nearby just going over the, the rocks, you know. But it became almost deafening because there was nothing else, you know, and just this for hours and hours, just the sound of the fire and the crack and the, the water going over the stones. Um, not deafening, but, you know, it was just all pervasive. Uh, you couldn't, uh, couldn't get away from it. So Isaiah, um, let's go to 55 now and 13. And this is more of a promise of what will be. Not what is, but what will be. 55.13. 55.13 says, Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So here Isaiah is uh, looking forward to the time when there'll be no more curse. No more briars and thorns and thistles. No more troubles and sadness and woe and tear. But a place where there'll be just these gentle, beautiful things for us to enjoy that God has for us. Now keep your finger there uh, for the moment. I want to come back to there in a moment's time. But come over to chapter 65. Chapter 65 and verse 21 and 2. Here we have a promise for what it will be like for us in practical terms, what it will be like for us when we come to finally inhabit our earth after it's been made new for us. God says that uh, his people shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And again, we, uh, I've had many Sabbath afternoon conversations where we've contemplated this scenario here. A place where we will have our own space, whether we want a, a hectare or a thousand hectares, I don't think it will matter. Whatever we think is uh, something that's suitable for us, God will gift it to us. And there we can grow the things that we enjoy. And um, of course, we'll have access to the tree of life and the water of life. But here's a, like an illustration of perhaps what it will be like for us as we long enjoy the work of our hands. You know, work won't be burdensome. It will be a delight. But we want to come back to the thorns and the thistles there we read about in chapter 55. It says there, Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come forth the myrtle tree. So that's what is now, isn't it? God is promising here that instead of those things, we will have the myrtle and the cypress. But currently we don't. We do have the thorn and the briar, don't we? And uh, they, are, of course, are, are symbols of, of sin. You know, the world we live in, the misery, the disappointments, the, the heartache, uh, the brokenness, our, our own sense of guilt and regret, all the various dysfunction of, of living in a sinful world with the sinful natures. Now, this is what these briars and these thorns represent to me at least. And um, you know, when we go back and look at Genesis, and we'll go back there now and see where these things came from, Genesis chapter 3, while they may uh, serve a purpose, they are to us constant reminders that of our fallenness. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Um, this is... God's first words of, if you like, consequences of their fall. Adam and Eve chose to disregard God's counsel and they allowed themselves to be swept away in this uh, thing we call sin. And this is how God describes the consequences of that. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, 
and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so tragically, the perfection and the beautiful uh, way in which God created our world, and particularly the way in which he made that Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve to live in, was, was broken. And here we see the consequences of that still today. You know, work is a burden. You know, giving birth to children, which would, you would think should be the most delightful experience of all, that God, the gift that God gave to women to be able to deliver a child to new life. And yet it's, it's tainted with sorrow and, and pain. Reminders that we live in a broken world. You know, every day we, we hear in the Western world we can go off to the supermarket and uh, buy a loaf of bread from the shelf. We can buy whatever it is we want to eat from the shelves there, refrigerated, you know, cooled, warmed, just perfect for our need. And, of course, we foolishly often indulge in things which are not for our need at all but for our want. Um, but, you know, there was a thing on the radio just a week or so back. They're establishing this garden in the city of Sydney here in order to teach children growing up in cities where their food comes from because we're you know these modern generations have no idea they have no real idea of the fact that you know milk comes from a cow and they're showing them how this this process works and of course it, it changes their whole way of thinking there's a little video clip I watched recently I think some of you may have seen it a little French boy and his mother's feeding him he's just a two-year-old he could, he could talk quite well but he was speaking about this octopus that his mother was uh, asking him to eat. And it was da- he could see this boy, the realisation dawning upon him what it was. It wasn't just food, it was actually a living animal that had been cut into pieces, killed. And uh, this boy's having this conversation with his mother. And he doesn't quite break into tears, but his mother does because she's realising for the first time her son is, is actually realising that food comes from other living creatures. And the boy is just, he's dismayed and horrified. And she says, don't worry, we won't eat them anymore. And I, I, I think the next chapter is that they become vegetarians. <laughs> well, I hope so anyway. But, you know, we live in this world where it's so convenient, isn't it? Uh, I, love, I love that thing uh, some years ago, is it, um, the founder of Facebook, Zuckerberg, I think, he made us some declaration that um, he would only eat flesh that he'd killed himself. So rather than just the convenience of going to the butcher shop or the fish market, he would actually take the life of the animal himself so that he would bear the impact of the life had to be sacrificed for him to enjoy what he wanted to eat. And I suspect he kills very few animals if he stuck to that pledge because not only is it inconvenient, but it's gruesome. You know, I've worked in the industry. It's a gruesome task. And I'm not here to talk about that necessarily, but you know, when sin came into this world... Death came with it, didn't it? And it's not, t- not too far further down the story where God actually says to them, you can eat meat. You know, at this stage, it's you know, fruit and seeds and nuts and grains. And then, of course, vegetables are added after sin came. And then later, of course, meat becomes a, a part of the, of the um, permissible diet. Um, and so this is, this is tragic for our world, that when sin animals, changed things. Originally, no. No, the Bible says very clearly that the animals were to eat the vegetation, the herb of the field, which is vegetables. Well, but because uh, Eve sinned, did that make the animals uh, accountable too? To I wouldn't blame Eve to start with. I'd blame Adam. Um, and uh, secondly, I wouldn't blame the animals in terms of accountability. They, they're creatures of, um, of habit or creatures of um, instinct. They, they have a different... Uh, they're driven by different uh, forces than we are. We are morally accountable. And this is really the key point of my sermon, so don't rush me ahead yet, uh, please, Warren. Okay. We're getting just to that, that point. <clears throat> the essential point of this is that um, we, um, we were made in the image of God in, in other respects. So my point here is that 
Upon uh, sin entering the world and Adam and Eve bringing sin into this world, the world became a dangerous place. You know, um, you know, the thorn and the thistle represent danger, don't they? And I guess Warren's question is very pertinent right here because perhaps it was at this point when animals began to fear men and to, and to hide from them and to not come and be with them and uh, ultimately to become ferocious. Uh, I don't think I could put my finger in the Bible anywhere and see where that happened, but certainly it happened. And uh, the Bible promises in the earth made new there'll be no more of that. The lamb and the lion will lay it in together. Didn't, didn't sin ultimately affect not only man, but nature itself? Absolutely, the whole world is affected by it. But I'm just making, I want to differentiate between the animals and the other parts of the world as compared to man. And we'll be there in a moment's time. Just, just bear with me for another moment. So <clears throat> we see here the world became a dangerous place. Eden was now gone. I think Ellen White tells us that God actually took it away to heaven to preserve its purity. So it wouldn't be on this world. And that whether that happened there or just prior to the flood, I just can't recall in my thinking. But at some point, God did take the Garden of Eden away. Have a look in chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. And we see where this, uh, this hardship, sorrow, dysfunction and selfishness didn't creep in. It just it, it swept in like a, like a tsunami. Uh, look up verse 12 and 13. The man said, so God is, God is uh, calling to Adam and asking him, why have you hidden yourself? Who told you you're naked? Have you eaten the forbidden fruit? Verse 12, the man said, that woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. So here he's blaming his wife and indirectly blaming God for the fact that he took the forbidden fruit. And then verse 13, the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, that serpent deceived me and I ate it. Again, indirectly blaming God. You made the serpent. It's your fault, God, that I did it. And so, of course, this is the dysfunction of sin, isn't it? Instead of being responsible and moral, they're blaming. It's selfishness now that, that rules and dysfunction and brokenness. And so the world becomes a dangerous place. It's not too far down the story where their two children are in mortal combat. One an innocent victim of the other. The brother kills the brother. What a tragedy that so close to the very beginning of this perfect Edenic uh, situation, we find murder, hatred and murder taking place. Come back to um, chapter 2. Because I want to go back even further now, beyond or back prior to sin entering into the world and therefore all of this dysfunction and hardship and tears and death, prior to that, we come back into chapter 2 and notice verse 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And here we find danger didn't come into the equation after sin. Potential danger was there right from the very beginning, wasn't it? The danger of giving man free will, giving man the freedom to choose to either obey or disobey. And of course, this goes back beyond the creation of this world to, to heaven, where God gave his intelligent beings free will and while this is potentially perhaps the most precious gift that God has given to us free will it's also the most dangerous gift that he's given in that he knows that we have the freedom to choose to do otherwise than serve to follow and obey and love in response and gratitude you know we uh, we um we've common I've heard it commonly taught that um, in the Bible says sin will not rise up a second time. You know, after the lake of fire has done its work and all of sin and Satan and evil has been wiped out, God creates this new world and he, he inhabits it with all of his saved people. Sin will never arise up again. We live in a perfect world, so it will be for eternity. But someone suggested recently that the potential, though, will always be there. See, we are free moral beings. Yes, Warren. 
but accept the responsibility for eating the fruit and said, I displeased you, Lord. Uh, can you forgive me? He certainly would have. In fact, he did. You know, we're told that if only Eve had have sinned, well, put it this way, if only one person had ever sinned, Jesus would have died for that one. But it would have required the death of Jesus to provide that forgiveness for that one. So if Eve had have repented, which she did, of course, but it's too late, the consequences were still death. But Jesus made provision for dying the second death. So the first death is just a consequence of not having access to the tree of life. The tree of life provides that conditional immortality. But the second death is a penalty for breaking the law of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So she would have died. This is like I mean, this is my thinking on the run here. She still would have died, but she would be resurrected after Jesus died in her place. Um, so forgiveness is available. That's that's in the heart of God. The plan of God was always was there, ready to go, in the event that they did sin. So God wasn't caught by surprise that they did it. He already had made a plan that Jesus would take their place and die that second death so they could be restored into harmony with God again. Again, it really, it's a, it's a speculative question. We, we, we know what did happen, and that's really all we need to be concerned about. She did it. Jesus died for their sins, just like he died for our sins. But the fact remains, the death of God, death of Jesus was required in order to reconcile us to God again. And so this place was still, even though perfect, there was this peril that if they were to reach out and take the forbidden fruit, God's plan would be um, ultimately his, his, his uh, eternal purpose would have been um, unsettled, destroyed, and sin came in, and this is, of course, what did happen. So God made man with free will the capacity to choose. Not only Adam and Eve, but all of us, all of his offspring have been given that capacity to choose. We're made in the image of God. Free will, moral beings. We make ethical choices. And uh, each of us will become or is morally accountable to God. And this is the difference, Warren, between all the various animals of the world. They have no moral accountability. Only we do. We're made in the image of God. We have the capacity in our minds to think and to choose and to act. Animals live by instinct. They're not morally responsible for their actions. In fact, they're victims of our, huma our humanity being fallen. And uh, because God gave Adam and Eve the capacity to choose, we see the rest unfold in history, the consequences of that. He passed on to us only what he had, and that was a fallen nature. And our fallen natures take us into the same path. So in the Garden of Eden, the choice was there to believe God or to not believe God, to trust God or to trust the servant, to be content with what things God had given them or to not be content. You, you think of it, what God gave them. They had everything and there was a one thing that he withheld and tragically they wanted, they were not content with what God had given them and they chose to take that which what had been forgiven, forbidden from them. And so, um, of course, we see disappointment springs from that. Just come forward to um, the time of Jesus. There's another garden. Actually, the, the title of my sermon is a, is a bit of a play on words. Obviously, you would think we're talking about the Garden of Eden, but it's, the text comes from this passage here in, in um, John chapter 18. There was a garden, and this is the garden where Jesus went when he was betrayed, remember? The Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and so Jesus comes there. The Old Testament tells that Jesus set his face like a flint. He'd made up his mind. He would go. He comes to the garden. What would he do? Would he stay the course? The, the eternal destiny of mankind hangs in the balance here. Jesus is also a free moral agent. He can choose, can't he? Yes, he's made a promise that he will come. He'll die for the sins of the world. That's why he's here. We talked about this this morning in Sabbath school. That was his mission. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came here with a purpose and he fulfilled his purpose. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happens? All of a sudden, or perhaps not all of a sudden, but we find him there 
wavering in his fall, in his, I should say his fallen humanity, but in his humanity, he wavers at the prospect of being eternally separated from his father. And so what shall he do? Shall he stay the course? Should he fulfil his mission or should he forsake it? Would he stay and honour his father and his promise or would he walk away? We know in uh, the gospel accounts, Matthew and Mark and Luke, it, it talks about him coming there with these three uh, desperate pleas for divine help. Lord, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. He doesn't want to do it. In his humanity, he shrinks back from the responsibility of dying for the sins of the world. But nevertheless, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. And so this garden is a perilous place for him. He comes there. He pours out his heart. He weeps and, and he, 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 uh, he sweats blood in his uh, desperate, final, desperate final struggle with the decision, what he will do, the free will he has the option to exercise here. See, it wasn't only Judas who betrayed Jesus, was it? Jesus warned them before they went into the garden. When the shepherd is struck, all the sheep will be scattered. They all betrayed him, didn't they? And ultimately, of course, all of us also had betrayed him. He was alone, the only one that stayed true to his trust, the only one that remained faithful to his, to his mission. So there was this garden, Gethsemane, the place where Jesus came to make his final decision to express his own free will. In Isaiah chapter 50, it says this in verse 7, For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. So this is a prophecy given seven or eight hundred years before Jesus that he claimed, I know that I will not be ashamed. And what did he say to the serpent in the wilderness? Man does not live by, every, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This was Jesus' comfort. This was Jesus' strength. What God had foretold in the Old Testament scriptures was what he looked to for courage and strength and resolve to press on. I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. In closing, the book of Corinthians says this, For he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Father made a decision. Jesus the Son made a decision that uh, impacted our eternal destinies. Now, we will, uh, if we remain faithful be able to walk in that garden, that original garden that God had made so long ago and be a part of the family of God who helped to spread that glorious garden throughout this world when God renews this world. It, uh, for all intents and purposes, will ever remain that way. There may always be that potential risk because we will always have free will to determine what we will do but the Bible is clear, isn't it? Sin will not rise up a second time. Was it affliction? Is that right, Luke? Affliction will not rise up a second time, I think it is, actually. But, but nonetheless, the promise is there, isn't it? And God's word is sure. We have a promise that there will be a place reserved for us in God's eternal kingdom, a garden renewed and, and uh, reinvigorated, a place of peace, a place, a place of joy, where all the animals again will... Uh, be able to enjoy not only their own company, but our company also. Uh, a place where there'll be perfect communion and understanding between, not only amongst ourselves, but between ourselves and God. A place there will be no more doubt or sorrow or pain or death to fear and hang over us like a terrible enemy, but a place where we will live forever. May God bless us to help us, strengthen us to exercise our uh, free will in the right way to serve and honour him, that uh, we may be able to help him fulfil his eternal purpose in saving us in his kingdom. God bless you all.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you today that we've had this uh, time together to worship you and to reflect upon your word. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we will uh, see the wonderful privileges we have as children of God living in this sin-darkened world with the, um, with the opportunity of knowing you, having a hope of a better future and having the great uh, um, responsibility and privilege of sharing your love with others. Lord, help us, we pray, to take you with us in in all of our daily activities, whether we are at work or play or travelling, whatever it is we do, Lord, may we uh, be looking for an opportunity to share the wonderful good news that you have a plan to save all those who are willing to come. Thank you, Father, for today. We thank you for the food and the refreshments we can enjoy now, and we pray you'll bless us with your continued presence. We ask this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.